Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Universal Design in Education, an Overview and Applications. ASEP is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Dr. Cheryl Bergstaller. Dr. Bergstaller founded and directs the Disabilities Opportunities Internetworking and Technology Center, also known as the DO-IT Center, at the University of Washington. Dr. Bergstaller is a prolific author and presenter on the topic of universal design. She also served as an educator for approximately 15 years. Again, it is my honor to present to you Dr. Cheryl Bergstaller. Thank you, Dr. Bergstaller, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. I'm happy to join you today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, universal design. My name is Cheryl Bergstaller, and I come from the University of Washington in Seattle. The talk today is on universal design and education, overview and applications. Let me tell you about the two UW centers that I founded and now direct. The Access Technology Center was founded in 1984 and is funded by the University of Washington. The DO-IT Center was founded in 1992 and is supported with federal, state, corporate, and private funds. It expanded to DO-IT Japan in 2007. The DO-IT program has as its goal to increase the success of individuals with disabilities in post-secondary education and careers using technology as an empowering tool. And to meet that goal, we have many activities that are in the United States and even in Japan and other countries. The Access Technology Center ensures that computers, software, and computing services are accessible to UW faculty, students, and staff. In this center, we consult and train on accessible design of IT. We host a showroom of assistive technology and ergonomic furniture. We consult and train on hardware and software for the university. In everything we do, we integrate AT into the campus computer labs. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that those facilities are welcoming and fully accessible to individuals with disabilities. Let's step back for a minute and just think about disability and ability. We like to focus on the ability side of that and think about every human being as having level of ability in certain areas. Uh, In this slide, we have ability that is on a continuum from not able to able. And then we can look at various functions that human beings tend to have. So we can look at seeing, hearing, walking, reading print, writing with a pen or a pencil, communicating verbally, tuning out distraction, and learning. And so some individuals, for instance, someone who's totally blind, might be at the not able end of the C scale, but most of us fall in the middle somewhere, not fully able, not 20-20 vision, and not being able to see in all different contexts, but fitting in there somewhere. Same with hearing and walking and so forth. And so we look at disability then as just a definition that in some ways is sort of arbitrary, defined by the government or someone else, and just defines where someone, how someone might be called if they fit on this continuum somewhere in one of these categories. Let's just take a quick look at the evolution of access and how we approached access for people with disabilities in all aspects of life. Well, many, many years ago, unfortunately, people with disabilities were simply excluded from many life activities, including education. And then we moved into a model that was more in the segregation category, that we provided service to them, but in a separate environment. Then we moved on to rehabilitation and accommodation. In rehabilitation, we try to fix the disability, try to improve function, and perhaps provide some assistive technology like a wheelchair to help a person meet 
the day-to-day -day demands of their life. And then accommodation fits in there as well, that we might provide a ramp um, to make something accessible or some other change in the environment so that a person with a disability can participate in something that the rest of us are participating in. The view that is promoted by disability advocates and people with disabilities alike these days is more along the lines of civil rights for other underrepresented groups. Disability is just considered a natural part of the human experience, and so we can build on social justice as our justification for providing full access. In other words, people with disabilities just have a right to be here, and we should expect them to be involved in whatever activity we're undertaking. And as an approach to, to social justice, we can employ a practice called universal design to make facilities and environments and other services more accessible and welcoming to individuals with disabilities. So in summary, today our approaches to access still include accommodations and a universal design. So what am I talking about when I talk about an accommodation? Well, I'm just talking about some kind of an alternative format, a service, and or some other adjustment for a specific individual. So when I use the word accommodation in this context, I'm thinking of it for an individual. That we make some change in something for this one person uh, that can't access the environment or use the product without making some kind of an adjustment beyond the capabilities that the product might have. But sometimes it's really clear that the environment or the product really needs to be modified rather than just provide an accommodation. This picture of a coffee pot that has a spout and a handle on the same side is a good example, an obvious example, of a product that might be flawed. And I think it would be silly for us to say, well, gee, this coffee pot for Masochus, as it's called, we could really maybe adjust it a little bit, and so it would be easier to pour coffee with this product. I can think of putting some plastic tubing in the spout and winding around a little bit or just pouring out of the top or something. But I think we'd all agree that that would be a pretty silly approach. A better approach would be let's improve this product so it's usable by more people more efficiently. And so universal design has us looking at the product or in the environment and making it more welcoming, more accessible, more usable for the most number of people. So if we take a look at the definition of universal design from the Center for Universal Design at North Carolina State University, from the field of architecture and product design, the definition is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. It's not possible to ever have everything fully universally designed. It's always on a continuum but we can always shoot for universal design as a goal. Universal design is not new. Here's a picture uh, from a newspaper clipping from the Daily, a student newspaper here at the University of Washington. This appeared as an article in 1970, a long time ago, and there was a young man who was quadriplegic that wore a sign on the back of his wheelchair that says, ramp the curbs, keep me off the street. Now, if you've been to the University of Washington, you know that it's very hilly. And at the time, to many people, that just seemed like an impossible dream. How would we ever ramp all of these curbs so that this young man didn't have to be out on the street going from class to class? But as we know, ramping curbs is just accepted these days as a part of the built environment. And so certainly, it's possible to be making facilities and environments more welcoming and accessible to people with disabilities. We know it's possible. And we also know one other thing, too. When we did ramp all of those curbs, most of the people using those features of a sidewalk are not people in wheelchairs. They're people with baby strollers or delivery carts and other people who might benefit from having a ramp rather than a curb. So universal design can be applied to just about anything. In education, it can be applied to student services, to instruction, to technology, to physical spaces. So on my next slide, I talk about the three steps then, about making some, having something that's inaccessible 
versus providing an accommodation versus making something universally designed. And I have three pictures. The first one, the inaccessible picture, shows someone in a wheelchair seated uh, before four steps that are clearly not accessible to that person. So they're kind of stuck. And so that's an example of something that's inaccessible to this population. The second one I'm labeling as an accommodation. And it shows a ramp. And this ramp happens to be made out of plywood. And it shows a person in a wheelchair going up that ramp. By the way, there are no handrails. Because it seems to be sort of thrown together, I'm going to call this an accommodation because I'm just going to assume that it was made for this one person or for a few people after the fact. It wasn't built into the design of that facility. The third picture shows a nice sloping ramp into a building, no steps, and people who are walking, people who are using wheelchairs are all using that same entrance. So it's an integrated approach and also that was designed into the building as it was created, not added later on. The other point I'd like to make in this next slide is, you know, universal design is always on a continuum and never perfect. For example, in this first picture, we have a person that is in a wheelchair and he's reaching a handle on a door. So it looks like he's able to open this door himself independently. So it's somewhat accessible, but I think we wouldn't say it's very high on the continuum. Then the next picture shows one of the buttons that you can push to open a door that makes it more accessible, but there are still some people who wouldn't be able to push that button. And so the third picture just shows one of our grocery store automatic door openers with sensors that automatically open the doors to anyone, not dependent on their size or what, what they're using for mobility, or maybe even if they're a human being. So I think the dogs can get in there too, perhaps. But, but anyway, that would be on the continuum much farther along as far as universal design. Okay, I think we're ready for a pop quiz. When a student has only one place to sit in an auditorium and it's not with his study group, is it because, I feel like we should have a drum roll here, and here are your response choices. He's in a wheelchair, of course, he's a wheelchair user. That explains it. So we, we can't expect that he can sit anywhere in the room. Ah, B, he did not make special arrangements with the Disability Services Office. They might have been able to arrange to remove a chair or something so that he could sit where he wanted to sit. C, clearly the ADA standards need to be changed because we built this building according to standards and uh, it's not fully flexible for this particular student. And D, the room is poorly designed. Well, I think we could look at each one of these and have a little discussion and maybe there's some truth to each one. But I think that the point in universal design is we look at D first. We look at the design of the room and ask ourselves, could this have been designed, uh, and better yet, if we're designing a new room, could we design it in a way that we would maximize the places a student in a wheelchair might be able to sit? We might not be able to make it possible for them to sit anywhere in the room, but at least do they have a few different choices? And is it obvious to them how they can do that so they can do it right at the time, not having to make arrangements, not having to call the Disability Services Office and having a chair removed in the auditorium when it might be a spontaneous thing where they went to a presentation and all of a sudden the speaker said, let's meet in small groups or whatever. And so again, we are looking at a continuum. There's no exact right answer here, but again, the process is what's important in universal design is to look at the environment first or the product first and ask ourselves how can we design it in a way that more people will find this facility welcoming and accessible to them. So I'm going to look at an example with you. As I said, we, we're into computers in my organization, so it seemed appropriate that I would choose an example on universally designing a computer or science lab. First of all, we'd want to make sure that everyone feels welcome, that the room is comfortable for everyone. Um, that means, you know, plenty of light, it's and the colors of the, the walls and so forth, the design uh, aspects of it, certainly. It's important that everyone can get to the facility and maneuver within it. 
If it's not in an accessible building, for instance, we can't expect wheelchair users to be able to come and, and use the facility the way we'd like them to. Everyone is able to communicate effectively with support staff. So making sure the support staff know how to communicate and uh, how to work with someone with a disability, particularly if they're requesting an accommodation. Everyone's able to access printed materials and electronic resources in the facility or outside of the facility in the case of web access to check on the schedule and so forth. And everyone can make use of the equipment and software. And so it's pretty simple what we're looking for. And then we can look through each of these categories and say, well, what if a person was blind? You know, how could we address all of these issues for a person who's blind or a person who has a learning disability or a person who, who has a mobility impairment or a hearing impairment? What are some of the things that we can do to make that facility welcoming and accessible? Well, here are just a few examples of many. And on our website, which I'll point you to at the end, you'll find many more examples in our handouts and, and web pages. So one thing a, a facility could do is be sure to include students with disabilities in the planning and evaluation. You know, do we ask them? Uh, we were designing a facility for a science lab not long ago, and we had the students with disabilities, about six of them with different types of disabilities, meet with the architects. Now, it was actually after the design was pretty much in place, and they were actually a little worried that maybe the students would have some big, grandiose ideas that couldn't be implemented at that time. But as I predicted, they were very practical. There were simple things, like in this particular case, there was going to be a button for opening the door, and it wasn't placed very well. And so some of the students suggested it be moved a little bit before it was installed. And the restroom, they made a few minor suggestions on where things could be placed. So including students with disabilities in all the planning and evaluation should be considered. Uh, consider the accessibility in procurement. This is another area when you're buying technology, in this case, science equipment, furniture. Ask about the accessibility features and think about students who have different heights, who um, have different capability as far as sitting for extended periods of time and standing for extended periods of time and people who are using wheelchairs and other mobility devices and so forth. Ensure that the facility and services are wheelchair accessible and also ensure that the publications can be reached from a seated position. In our office area, we put our handout bins uh, lower on the wall than you would typically find them and make sure that someone in a seated position, typically someone using a wheelchair, can reach the highest row of them. This means that someone who's walking might have to reach a little lower for the lowest row, but again, we feel that it makes it more accessible to the greatest number of people by adjusting in this way. Include adjustable height tables. When we're designing computer labs or workspaces, we suggest that there be an adjustable height table for every operating system that's included in the lab, and that, that those tables be placed in such a way that they're accessible in, in other ways. So you don't have to buy adjustable height tables for every workstation in a science lab or a computer lab, but you should have a few. Make an accessible route of travel throughout the facility. And this includes that there aren't things in the way, debris and so forth, boxes that are in the way, that make it uh, not only difficult for someone who uses a wheelchair or other mobility device to move and maneuver around, but someone who's blind or has low vision Include high contrast directional signs. The text should be large and also the signs should be very clear. I think we all could make a PowerPoint presentation on just funny signs that aren't real clear what they're doing. So um, look at the signage and see um, how it can be made more accessible to someone who might have a visual impairment, but also someone who really wants to find an accessible and uh, straightforward route uh, through the facility or to a restroom or whatever. Make part of a service counter accessible from a seated position. So in the case of the do-it office, we have a typical counter and it's made out of steel case furniture, adjustable different sections. And so we ordered one section to be lower than the other section. And so we have a lower height and a higher height. It didn't cost us one penny more to do it that way, but because we thought ahead, we were able to make it accessible to people using wheelchairs, people who are uh, short in stature, 
and also people that are standing. Keep aisles wide so that there's plenty of room to walk and free of clutter. Include some quiet work areas. Uh, maybe there can be some areas that are even blocked off a little bit in a computer lab with a little room divider for people that are easily distracted because of attention deficit disorder or some other conditions. Include space for working groups, making sure that there's room for someone who's using a wheelchair to be participant in that group. And important too is to prepare staff and teachers to work with all students. Uh, one important thing if you have lab staff is to make sure they know how to respond to a request for an accommodation. That's a pretty simple thing, but even if their response needs to be at times, we'll all have to check on that. They should own the question if someone asks for an accommodation. They should say, well, let me check on that, or this is what we can provide, and so forth. An appropriate response is not, oh, I really don't know. I don't think we've ever done that. I don't, I don't handle that type of issue. So looking at this next slide, I just have a group of pictures showing who are the beneficiaries of universal design of a computer or science lab. It shows pictures of a person in a, in a wheelchair, so certainly people with mobility impairments. It shows people who are blind, well, two young uh, women in a science lab, and then a, a man who's using a computer with earphones, and a student who has a learning disability. All these people in other words, everyone can benefit from universal design. And one of the pictures shows a group of people working at the same computer. And those individuals might have a wide range of abilities in multiple areas, but they can all participate together and they have room in the facility to participate in whatever activity they're working on right there. So to kind of summarize a bit, universal design is an attitude which values diversity but also equity and inclusion. It's a goal that we'll never reach, but we're always working toward. It's a process. It's going through a series of steps right from the beginning and the planning stages and thinking of all the people who might use a facility rather than looking at the average student or the average person that's going to use the facility. We think of the wide diversity of individuals that are using a facility, including in the case of K-12 education, parents who might be um, visiting the school, volunteering, and so forth. Is the facility accessible to them if they should have a disability? And universal design is a series of practices that make learning products and environments welcoming, accessible, and usable for everyone. And on our webpage, we provide a lot of checklists for doing that very thing that will help people who are designing facilities and products in the educational environment to make them more welcoming and accessible and usable for everyone. And so we have checklists on computer labs and science labs and residential living in the post-secondary setting and career services offices and on and on. This next slide has a picture of a young man who is in a wheelchair in a skateboard park apparently and he is flipping over in his wheelchair and I can see that there are some other skateboarders around the area. I found this on the internet and they just had a, a little label that said at skateboard park and to me when I first looked at it I immediately thought of universal design and so this slide says know it when you see it universal design know it when you see it the reason I realized that there was some aspect of universal design is I'm assuming that a skateboard park, and this one in particular, was not designed specifically for someone who's using a wheelchair, but clearly it was designed in such a way that this person could actually use it. And so there's some universal design element in there. The other reason I like this picture is that universal design doesn't mean that it's a good thing to do. I'm glad that this young man is not my son flipping over in his wheelchair in a skateboard park. But it does mean that it's accessible to everyone. So if you universally design a computer lab or some other facility that really isn't meeting the needs of students in the school, universal design isn't going to make it any better, but it's going to make it be able to be used by more people. And so it's important to think of what element universal design is. And as I mentioned earlier in the case of instruction, if, you're, if you have a poor lesson, universally designing it will make it accessible to more students in the room. It doesn't make it a good lesson in and of itself. 
So universal design is one aspect of everything that we do. It's an important layer to consider as we're developing facilities, instruction, services, information technology, and on and on and on. My last slide is an invitation. It's an invitation to visit the Center for Universal Design and Education, which is hosted by DOIT at www.uw.edu slash D-O-I-T slash C-U-D-E. The Center for Universal Design and Education was funded by the uh, Department of Education through a series of three grants through the Office of Postsecondary Education, and we continue to update it and maintain it uh, through DOIT. And we provide a center for resources that we've created through these grants, but also links to other uh, resources around the country and actually around the world on how we can apply universal design in educational settings. So thank you for having me join you today. It's been fun talking about, as I said, my one of my favorite topics, universal design. And I hope even for those of you that know a lot about universal design and more about it in particular specific areas than I might know, hopefully this presentation gives you kind of a nice way to think about it, looking at it from the big picture and what it really means and how it fits into the design process and everything we do. So have a good day and thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Universal Design in Education, an Overview and Applications. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding universal design in educational environments. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Cheryl Bergstaller, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation at acefacilities.org. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.